Okay. Thank you, Willis. I want to um, have a praise also today. Uh, this week, uh, Jean and I celebrated 43 years of marriage. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. So, love you, Jean. The scripture, what iron sharpens iron, comes to mind. <laughs> Two independent-minded people. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's have prayer before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, we would just ask and pray that you be with us now. Please speak through this feeble instrument, dear Lord Jesus. Please give clarity of thought and expression and help us in this time in Earth's history. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, there we go. We are now living in what Scripture calls perilous times. We're in it now. America, once a Christian society, has cast off just about every vestige of biblical morality and has become a pagan society while still hoping we can label it as Christian. Oh yes, some fewer and fewer attend church and lots and lots of people claim to be Christian and believe in God, but many of these never read their Bibles. There are a few vestiges of Christianity barely permeating our culture and now, in our legislatures and courts, Christian standards have given way to an atheistic liberty and equality, akin to the cry of liberty and equality that was the hallmark of the French Revolution and of the reign of terror that followed. So-called moral freedom, equality for all, now reigns as God. It is as if the devil has opened the floodgates of evil. We are overwhelmed with extravagant materialism, sexual aberrations, abortions, drugs, and unchecked crime. The left exults each time a Christian standard is torn down. The nuclear family and traditional marriage are looked upon as old-fashioned. The battle over morality is now being fought in the public schools where parents voice strong opposition to what they see as an atheistic education being foisted, foisted upon their children. Many have become distrustful of our health care systems and the federal agencies that are supposed to be monitoring them. They see medical big pharma complex putting huge profits over protection of the public health and well-being. The trust in the institutions of society that are supposed to be the bulwark of a free society is disintegrating. It may be that Christians and the right will attempt to turn this overwhelming flood around by legislating our way back to Christian standards. But friends, that's not going to change things. That's not going to change behavior. There is only one option left for the Christian church now, and it is not an easy one. The church's task now is to wake out of sleep, to get on our knees, and to open our Bibles and to pray as we never have before. Amen. It is only by a spirit-filled revelation of Christ in the life that the church can rouse the world from their deathly stupor to sit up and take notice of Christians. Only as we truly display Christ in you, only as the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, will the church reclaim its lost ground. <clears throat> Today, I want to look at what the Bible says about a revival in the last days. The Bible uses the symbol of rain to describe a spirit-led revival among God's people. Scripture speaks of two seasons of rain, the former and the latter rain. In the land of the Bible, the former rain falls at the sowing time. It is necessary in order that the seed may germinate. Under the influence of the fertilizing showers, the tender shoot springs up during the early rain. 
The latter rain, falling near the close of the harvest season, ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. Both rains were promised dependent upon the obedience of the people. Deuteronomy 11, 13 and 14, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain. So both rains were dependent upon the obedience of the people. The prophets used these symbols of the former and latter rain to represent the work of the Holy Spirit. The rain is imperative to yield the fruit of the Spirit. No rain, no fruit on the vine. No mature fruit is available. The reception of the Holy Spirit in the heart causes the seed to germinate, and one is born again. The Holy Spirit then works in the life to cause spiritual growth. It causes the fruit to ripen. The Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another the process of spiritual growth. Of course, the goal of any gardening process is ultimately to produce mature fruit that is ready for harvest. Mark 4, 28 and 29, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, when the fruit matures, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The ripening grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. Turn with me to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel chapter 2. And the prophetic scriptures stress the necessity of the latter rain just prior to Jesus' return. Also, it links the early rain with the latter rain. They are both necessary to produce mature fruit. Turn to Joel 2, verse 1. It's obvious this chapter is speaking with the second coming. Joel 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. The watchmen living just before the second coming are to sound an alarm. Now go to verse 23. Verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So God's people are to rejoice in the fact that the Lord has promised rain prior to his coming to harvest this earth. And in verse 28, Joel tells us that Jesus here is speaking of his Holy Spirit. Verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now, if we go to Acts chapter 2, Peter points out when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost that this scripture in Joel is a fulfillment, uh, is being fulfilled in his time in Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> he tells us in Acts 2, 16 and 17, but this, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So, the Holy Spirit was being poured out in Acts 2. And Peter says, this is a fulfillment of that scripture. And note, remember in the scripture, the, the early and the latter rain are closely linked. They are almost seen as a unit. And the events of Pentecost were but a partial fulfillment of Joel's prediction. Because Joel's prophecy includes both the former and the latter rain in Joel 2.23. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former and the latter rain. 
So Joel's prophecy was partially fulfilled in Acts 2. And we're told the prophecy is to reach its full accomplishment in the manifestation of divine grace, which will attend the closing work of the gospel. Turn to Zechariah 10, verse 1. Zechariah 10, verse 1. Zechariah and Malachi in the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah 10, verse 1. And it says there, in Zechariah 10, verse 1, that God's people are to ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So we are instructed in the time of the latter rain to ask for the latter rain, just preceding Christ's coming. But note, we must have the early rain experience in our life in order to receive the latter rain. In Israel, the farmer had to have the early rain to cause the seed to sprout. If there was no early rain, the latter rain could fall, but it would do no good. Have you ever put seeds in the ground and they never come up because there hasn't been rain? It's the same thing. You have to have both rains. We cannot expect to receive the latter rain if we have no oil in our lamps, which is another symbol in Matthew 25 of the wise and the foolish virgins. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The wise virgins in the, oil, in the parable had oil in their lamps. The foolish had no oil. When the bridegroom came, the wise virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. They had oil in them. The foolish virgins, remember, they tried to buy oil from them, but it was too late. They had not made an effort to get the oil. In order to be prepared to receive the latter rain, we must now have a daily living connection with Christ, the source of all spiritual growth. Amen. The experience of the disciples under the early rain was that of confession and forsaking of sin. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So friends, an old experience we can't rely on. We can't say, and it's wonderful, I was converted 40 years ago. That experience is not going to prepare us to receive the latter rain. Amen. Turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Hebrews, James in the back of the New Testament. James chapter 5. It says there, this whole chapter is dealing with the last days just prior to the second coming. James chapter 5, verse 3. Ye have heaped together treasure for the last days. Verse 9. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Now look at James 5, 7 and 8. It says there, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the what? The early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Establish your hearts. This is the work we are to do to prepare for the latter rain. Establish means to strengthen, to have an increased determination, a further resolve to seek God. Yes, the strength comes from God, but he calls upon us to yield ourselves more fully to him, to choose more decidedly to have him work in us, to cast off a Laodicean careless attitude. Amen. Turn with me to Acts 3, 19 through 21. Acts 3, 19 through 21. And notice this prophecy of Peter here, he links the early rain with the work to be done in the latter rain. Acts 3, 19 through 21, which we read for our scripture verse. It says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. 
so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached unto you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things. Peter calls on his hearers under the early reign to, be, to repent and to be converted. Repentance includes both a sorrow for sin and a turning away from sin. And converted means our life is turned around. When we are born again by the Holy Spirit, there's a turning away from the old life of sin to a brand new life in Christ. And these acts, he says, would be followed by three things. Three things. Number one, the blotting out of their sins. Number two, the coming of the times of refreshing. And number three, the glorious advent of Jesus Christ. Those three things are going to follow. He saw, Peter saw that certain prophecies of the last days were meeting a fulfillment in his day. For example, in Acts 2.17, he quotes the prophecy of Joel 2. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This outpouring of the early reign of Pentecost was but a partial fulfillment that is linked to the pouring out of the latter rain just prior to Christ's return. Likewise, Peter also in Acts 3.19 is speaking of the blotting out of sins. The actual blotting out of sins takes place in the last days of this earth's history, just before Jesus comes. We know that the great time prophecy of Daniel 8.14 tells us when the blotting out of sins began. The work of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary began in 1844 unto 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And later the, the angel Gabriel came to Daniel in Daniel 9 and explains to him when this time prophecy of the 2,300 years began. It began in 457 B.C. and it ends in 1844. The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary began in 1844. And at that time, Christ entered the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary to begin his last work of atonement. The last work of Christ before he returns is the blotting out of sins. When he returns, he will come, as it says in Hebrews 9, 28, without sin unto salvation. And if anyone has a question on this great time prophecy, feel free to ask one of the elders or myself, and we will direct you to further information. It says, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. But before the removal or blotting out of sins from the heavenly record books, there must be an examination of the book of records to determine who, through repentance and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. This work must be done prior to Jesus' return, for we are clearly told in Revelation 22, 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So the rewards are determined before Jesus comes again. There is no second chance after the heavenly sanctuary closes and Christ gets ready to come. In Acts 3.19, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, calling the people to repent, to be converted, and to have their sins blotted out. That's the message there, right? To repent, to be converted, and to have our sins blotted out. And it is true that those in Peter's day who truly repented, who went on to live a life consecrated to Christ, who had their sins covered by the blood of Christ, and their sins are going to be blotted out during the investigative judgment, that they were going to be saved. Is not this true today? Amen. If we pass away before Jesus' return, and we remain faithful, and we remain asleep in the grave, when our case comes up in the judgment, our sins will be blotted out. And the next thing we will see is the glorious return of Christ in the clouds with all the holy angels. It's the same today. 
But Peter's words here in Acts 3 were a prophecy pointing forward to the last days in this earth's history, the blotting out of sins, and then the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ. So while the work in the heavenly sanctuary is closing up on this earth, which is now, there is promised the latter rain, the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, literally from the face of the Lord, from the throne of God. Peter tells us of these two great events then, the mighty outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, the latter rain, the final blotting out of sins of the righteous, which are tied to the third climactic event, the second advent of Christ. The latter rain is poured out just before Jesus comes to prepare a people to stand in the last days. Great controversy. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled at the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. So, since we know the early rain is tightly linked to the latter rain, wouldn't it be interesting to see what happened during the early rain? And probably the same things are going to happen under the latter rain. Wouldn't it be good to know what the people were doing to prepare for the early rain? Wouldn't we probably need to do the same things to prepare for the latter rain? Amen. So let's look at this. <clears throat> the first thing is prayer. Amen. Jesus gave clear instructions to the disciples in Luke 24, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now, I don't want to make too much of it, but Jerusalem was probably not a location that they thought was the best place to hang around in. You know, the Lord of glory had just been nailed up on the cross there. And Jesus said, stay there, stay there. So the disciples stayed there. But they didn't just sit around in idle chatter. They prayed earnestly during this time. They knew that Jesus had ascended to heaven and was at the right hand of the majesty on high. Acts 1.14 tells us these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They were united in their purpose. They sought God earnestly for the promise of the Holy Spirit. They humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. They put away all desires, all differences, all desire for supremacy. They came together closely in Christian fellowship. That was the work for preparation. They answered because just before pouring out of the early rain it says in Acts 2.1 and when the Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord the preparation was time was one of deep heart searching they couldn't rely on their former experience disciples felt their spiritual need they cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving do we need that today do we need that Amen. today? We do. The former rain. Now, remember, there's the former and the latter rain. And the latter rain is, is given to ripen the grain. It represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. But if we neglect the former rain, the latter rain may fall on all around us, but it will do us no good. It is one continual process. We must be now searching our hearts and seeking the Lord to cleanse us from sin in our hearts. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The same work 
only in greater degree must be done now. Now that's clear, isn't it? I mean, that's very clear. So the same work. Jesus says, speaking of just prior to his return in Luke 21, 35, for as a snare shall it come on them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. The latter rain is not going to fall on us without heart preparation. It's not like Jesus is going to wave a magic wand and suddenly we are going to be spiritually prepared. We are going to have a deeper mm. experience in Christ. Mm. No. Preach it. When the early rain fell in Jerusalem on those disciples, those who had not made any heart preparation, they mocked the disciples, didn't they? They said, these men are full of what? Wine. New wine. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. Amen. We are to ask for the latter rain in Zechariah 10, 1, right? Amen. The Holy Spirit comes from the throne of God, and yet we have to ask for the latter rain. <clears throat> God is not going to send the rain without our cooperation. We must seek his favor with the whole heart if the showers of grace are to come upon us. Turn to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. And here um, Zechariah is given a vision. In Zechariah chapter 4. Um, and he is shown, the prophet is shown the golden candlestick with seven lamps, like the seven branch candlestick in the earthly sanctuary. We can sort of, hopefully, you can see the picture of it here. And the uh, two olive trees on each side of the lamp. We're told the holy oil comes from the olive trees into the lamp. And Zechariah asked the angel, what do the two olive trees represent? And in verse 14, then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And the import of this message is in verse 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. The mission of these two angels that stand by is to give light and power to his church. They are on standby, if you will. God is ready to communicate his Holy Spirit. But we leave them in standby mode if we are not asking for the holy oil. If we are not preparing to receive the Holy Spirit. Friends, it's no time now to be taking a nap. It's no time now to be in a state of spiritual unreadiness. It's no time now to be skipping church. We must ask and have the oil in our lamps. Many are wondering, what is our work right now? What should I be doing? This is it. Right now, we're to be asking for the Holy Spirit. Right now, we are to be preparing our hearts to make room for the Holy Spirit. God has the oil supply in heaven. Now, while the angels are holding back the four winds, we are to be asking for the supply of spiritual grace. There's not an oil shortage in heaven, folks. The problem is with the vessels here on earth. That's right. There is no time now for self-pleasing. Now is when we should be in earnest prayer. But those who do not cultivate the spirit and habit of prayer cannot expect to receive the golden oil of goodness, patience, long-suffering, mercy, and love. Now, I want to look. What was the burden of the message on the day of Pentecost under the early reign? Because this message should be similar under the latter reign. At least I think so. And the, if you turn back to Acts 2, and let's just stay there for a while, Acts 2, we see what the message was under <clears throat> the early reign. Acts 2, 32 and 33, it says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, 
And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Christ resurrected to the heavenly sanctuary as our victorious king and high priest who is ministering his shed blood and pouring out his Holy Spirit was the burden of the message under the latter reign. Should this not be an emphasis? Uh, was the burden of the message under the early reign? Excuse me. Should this not be the emphasis under the latter reign? It should be, right? Some of us, me included, seem to think that the third angel's message consists only in defining for people who the beast is, what the mark of the beast is, and telling people, well, you better avoid it to be saved. <laughs> and that's a powerful message. It's a powerful message. And it is undoubtedly part of the message. But we have to also point people to what Christ is doing now, to where they can obtain power to refuse the mark and to worship the Lamb alone. Because friends, I don't care how much solid spiritual strength you think you have now, it's not going to be enough when this thing comes down. We need power from on high. Amen. Christ crucified and risen to the right hand of the heavenly throne was the emphasis of the message under the latter reign. Notice how a victorious Christ now at the right hand of God is linked with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Here Peter at Pentecost in Acts 5, 31 and 32, he says, Him, Him who you crucified has God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we, we are His witnesses of these things that Jesus is in heaven. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey Him. Friends, do you think they were sure in their faith? Yeah, I think they were. The martyr Stephen, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, links Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He says in Acts 7, 55 and 56, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Do you think Stephen spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he arraigned the whole system of Judaism and said, this is it? I think he did. One Seventh-day Adventist writer says, the expression to sit at God's right hand occurs 20 times in the New Testament. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 12, and 13. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I got a blessing out of studying Hebrews, didn't you, last quarter? What a blessing. And this thought here is that Jesus, after his crucifixion, after his ascension, he sat down. It doesn't mean that God wants us to know that Jesus took a rest in heaven. No, no. Sat down means he has assumed, he has taken up his high priestly, kingly office of authority and that everything now is going to the finish line. There's no stopping. This thing is going through. It will result in the final victory over his enemies. His enemies are the devil, the death, the grave and the wicked. And all of them are going to be thrown into the lake of fire and utterly burned up. There's no eternally burning hell, folks. Read all about it in Revelation 20. Christ and God's full intent and purpose now, and it has always been, but for sure now, is victory and eternal redemption for those whose lives are hid in Christ. Those who have been cleansed by the powerful blood of the Lamb. Friends, there's power. Power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. In the book of Revelation, 
Jesus is portrayed as the lamb slain, applying his shed blood to give victory over sin and the devil. 28 times in Revelation, Christ is referred to as the lamb. Christ, crucified and risen, now rules as the lamb. The saints overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They wash their robes in the blood of the lamb and make them white. Their names are written in the book of life of the lamb. The victorious saints sing the song of the lamb. The lamb returns as king of king and lord of lords. We are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and in the earth made new friends there will be no more curse but the kingdom shall have the throne of God and of the lamb in it Amen. is the lamb important you think in God's last day message Amen. the message of the lamb slain and now sitting at the right hand of God is to be given to a dying world turn to Revelation 5 verse 6 Revelation 5 verse 6 and I know I've mentioned this before, but it just thrills my soul. Revelation 5, verse 6. Here John is shown Christ as a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. One SDA theologian writes, Christ as a once slain but again living lamb standing at the throne of God carries a significant truth. In Revelation 5 verse 6 where it says had been slain, he says in the original language denotes that Christ had been slain in the past but the results obtained by his death remain and they are always available for the redemption of repentant sinners. Praise God for that, right? Amen. Praise God. And this lamb has horns, seven complete, and eyes, seven, indicate Christ's absolute power and wisdom. This thing is going through to completion. It underscores the continuous efficacy of his sacrifice, the writer says. It clearly marks out the heavenly sanctuary the heavenly sanctuary now is the command center. The command center where Christ is going to carry forward his work to completion. In Adventist church history, let's see if we can get there. In Adventist church history, Many know that in 1888, the message of Jones and Wagner presenting Christ and his righteousness was given. And Ellen White said, this is it. This is the third angel's message. And here is what they said about the slain lamb. The uplifted Savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the lamb slain. Efficacious means it's going to produce an effect. In this case, the cleansing from sin. The uplifted Savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the lamb slain sitting upon the throne to dispense the priceless covenant blessings. She writes, the efficacy of the blood of Christ was to be presented to the people with freshness and power that their faith may lay hold upon its merits. Every sin acknowledged before God with a contrite heart, he will remove. This faith is the life of the church. The blood of the slain lamb. That has merit. And that is the life of God's church. And she said of that message a year later, that this is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. That, she said, was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, there are 290 references to the love of God, 290 times when God declared his love for man. But in that same New Testament, there are 1,300 references to the atonement, 1,300 references that salvation can be had through the blood of Christ. Many years ago, there was a great conference of many religions in Chicago. There were the Eastern religions, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and many others. Practically every known religion was represented. And during one session, Dr. Joseph Cook of Boston suddenly rose and said, Gentlemen, 
I beg to introduce to you a woman with a great sorrow. Blood stains are on her hands, and nothing she has tried will remove them. The blood is that of murder. She has been driven to desperation in her distress. Is there anything in your religion that will remove her sin and give her peace? A hush fell upon that gathering. Not one of these religious leaders replied. Raising his eyes heavenward, Dr. Cook cried out, John, can you tell this woman where she can find peace? And then he cocked his ear and he said, John speaks, listen. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. Not a soul broke the silence. The representative of the Eastern religions and the Western cults sat dumb. In the face of human need, friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only religion that can meet our real need. Amen. The blood of the Lamb is the only thing that could meet this woman's great need. Only the blood of the Lamb has merit. Only the blood of the Lamb is efficacious. Only the blood of the Lamb can cleanse from our guilt and shame of sin. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ is heaven's currency in its business of salvation. An author writes, That is the merits of his sinless life and atoning death are what he pleads before God in behalf of every repentant sinner. Friends, our time, our focus in this time is to be on the present living Lamb as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, preparing to close up his work there. He is not entered into the holy places made with hands which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. And the next verse says, Unto them that look for him, unto them that look for him there, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Where is your focus? Is your focus on Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary? That's where our focus has to be. Friends, we must not only know about the slain lamb, we must know the lamb. We must apply the blood in our hearts for forgiveness of sin. The power is in the blood applied to the heart. We must enter in by faith into the heavenly sanctuary to know where the lamb is, to know his location, to know even he has an infinite supply of cleansing blood, but to not know the Lamb and to fail to enter in by faith into his last work of atonement, that's simply an intellectual religion. Lots of great information, but no power, friends, no power. We must be asking for and applying the blessings. We must be seeking God with our whole heart. We must be preparing our hearts to receive the latter rain. Amen. Now, one other thing. During the early rain, it resulted in something, didn't it? It changed people. It brought deep conviction of sin. It brought the power of Christ into the light. It brought heartfelt repentance. And those who joined were a peculiar people. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This was not just some intellectual message. In Acts 2 verse 38, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart. It did something. In Acts 5, when the disciples were summoned to speak before the priests, it says in Acts 5, 31 through 33, they didn't, knock, they didn't cower. They uplifted the truth with boldness. Him has God exalted to be a prince and a savior. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. And when they heard these things, they were what? Pricked in the heart. They were cut to the heart. You know, it had power. 
It was a message that confronted one with the fact that they were a sinner in need of deep repentance, in need of a change of heart. The message of Stephen in Acts 7 pierced even the armor of the false sanctity of the priests. And it caused such conviction that it says in Acts 7, 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Those pious, evil leaders, their false sanctity was stripped away and they lost it. This message will be powerful, friends. It will do something. The message of the early reign not only worked deep repentance, it also called for a turning away from sin. Acts 3, 26 Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Friends, we can't rely on a former experience. Under the latter reign, there is going to be deep repentance, a deeper desire to reveal Christ more fully. The gospel under the early reign in Acts 2.42 produced a holy people in Acts 2.42. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They didn't apostatize soon after baptism. They continued steadfastly, it says, in the doctrine and in the fellowship, and they did both. Friends, they came to church. They sought God as a body. And God answered as they sought him as a body. Yeah, we can stay home and watch It Is Written and 3ABN. But friends, there's no power in that. I hate to tell you. Amen. God is going to bless a body. Not an isolated group of people sitting on their living room in their pajamas watching religious programming. As a result of this, the true fear of God came upon the church. And it says, and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. One interest prevailed. One subject swallowed up all others. All hearts beat in harmony. The only ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. She says, these scenes are to be repeated and with greater power. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the former rain, but the latter rain will be more abundant. Friends, the gospel message under the latter rain are going to produce the same type of people. The current prevailing gospel message of the fallen churches that sees the gospel as only a setting straight of the record in heaven, one that makes light of or even denies the authority of God's law, one that tolerates known sin in the life when Christ comes, that gospel is not going to bring the latter rain. I hate to tell you, it's not. We know for sure because in Revelation 14, 12, John saw the character of the people who were produced by the third angel's message. And it says, here's the patience of saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friends, I just want to read one last closing quote. And it says that the 1888 message that presented Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, ministering his slain blood, is going to be part of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It says, It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest and obedient to all the commandments of God. She says, This will impart the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. The righteousness of Christ is not just a cloak to cover your sin. The righteousness of Christ is to be woven into our character. Amen. You get that? Amen. You know, for so long, I thought the righteousness of Christ was just, you know, like a thing to make me right. And it is, but it is also to be woven into our character. She says, this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message. 
which, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. So there we have it. The question is, will we rest satisfied with the Laodicean condition? Or will we now seek Christ with our whole heart and by his grace conform our lives to his pattern? Will we plead for the latter rain power to move hearts, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, to give victory over sin and bring in everlasting righteousness? Will we plead for power to prepare us for the great end time harvest? Our closing song is number 246. Let's stand together as we conclude our service today with this beautiful hymn, Worthy, Worthy is the Lamb. us to something that is way out and above ourselves. And we need your power. Amen. Dear Lord, you have not just called us to another church on the block, another way of looking at scripture. That is true. For you have called us into an end time movement that is to reveal the character of Christ to a world that is speeding on.